We're with Living Web Farms. We're an education and research farm located in Mills River. And we educate on all aspects of sustainable living, cooking being one of those. Sourcing your food, cooking it, creating deliciousness with locally sourced, sustainably grown ingredients. So tonight we're just kind of doing a fun class. No theme other than springtime, vegetables, seasonal cooking, but we're focusing on small plates, appetizers, soups, and salads. Um, so maybe you're entertaining, or maybe you're just looking for quick lunches. Um, so some of these will apply in all those categories and some of them only in others. So first I'm just gonna give you a taste. This is the sweet and spicy chilled carrot soup. And we're not gonna talk a whole lot about soups tonight. And if you want more, please tell me because we have plenty here. We make all our own stocks and I heard you asking about that so I thought I would just throw it out there. Do you like it? Good. This is a really simple soup. This is completely vegan. It doesn't have any dairy in it which is surprising because it turns out being really creamy. Um, and it's very simple to make. Basically, whenever I'm making a soup, usually I find myself making soups when I'm just trying to get rid of things. Like I made one for my family the other night with pretty much every leftover vegetable we had in our fridge and some noodles and a little tofu. Once I got it all in there, I just seasoned the broth, you know, with mustard and cream and a little white wine in order to give it more distinct flavor than just leftovers, right? And it turned out really wonderful. So basically whenever I'm making a soup, I just start with, if I want a thick and creamy soup, I can start by making a roux. Is everybody familiar with that process? Right, so it's usually equal parts, some kind of flour and fat in the pan until you get it thick and bubbly and then you can add your stock or water or wine or whatever um, and then stir constantly until it thickens. For this soup, it's just a stick of butter in the bottom of the pan and your onions and your carrots and your spices and then once those are kind of tender, you pour all your stock over top, you boil it, and then set it simmering covered until it's tender enough to puree. Then you add in a little honey and some extra seasonings, and you've got a pretty decent, quick, vegan soup. The butter does make it a bit creamy. So do you use sweet butter? Or? I use unsalted butter, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful. If you don't eat butter, you could easily use Earth Balance or Vegan Substitute, or you could use olive oil. But again, you won't get the same creaminess. You can add coconut, or you can add almond milk to it. That also tends to do it. Almond milk has higher, has different, more complex proteins in it than most of the milk substitutes. So if you're trying to thicken, it's a better thing to use. I teach a lot of meat classes, but this is a vegetable class, and I'm always going on and on in my in my meat classes about terrines basically just being anything suspended in a gel. It doesn't have to be meat. And I'm always talking about how you might make a vegetable terrine, and I decided I would just do it. So terrine is French for earthenware dish, but it's generally come to mean anything suspended in a gel, like I said. Um, you could use agar if you're vegan. But basically it is um, a bunch of vegetables. I used watermelon radish, snow pea, and leek, and I Chopped them up pretty fine because I wanted it to look like confetti, basically. And some edible flour, some mustard flour and some arugula flour. And then I made a stock with white wine and a, like pretty much the tops of everything I had chopped. So this is a great way to make stock, getting back to that question. Anytime you're trimming vegetables for a casserole or a purpose, just save your tops, your root ends, even your onion papers. Um, and then keep them in the fridge. I keep like a little yo quart yogurt container in my fridge. And weekly, I'm just putting, then we also have a worm bin. So whatever I'm not giving my worms, I'm putting like my garlic, um, my onion skins into this little container. And then at a certain point in the week, I dump it all in a pot, fill it with cold water, and set it to boil for 45 minutes at the minimum. And that's a super easy way to get veggie stock. And you can do that when you're prepping a meal, right? So you can either make it ahead of time, store it in the fridge, or you can just do it as you're trimming. So I took the tops off of a leek here. I took um, the root end and the top off of a radish. I put a bunch of parsley in there, one rib of celery and some carrots. It's in the recipe, just all in there. And then dumped a bottle, like maybe half a bottle of white wine on it, put some salt in it, and then just set it simmering. And then I took a couple envelopes of unflavored gelatin, sprinkled them on top so that it would thicken a little bit. So um, and some balsamic vinegar. And then all I did is basically like making lasagna. Like I'm putting a layer of that 
stock with the gelatin in it in the bottom of the pan, sprinkling the flowers and the vegetables, another layer of the balsamic stock, and I'm letting it sit in the fridge, letting it set up. So the first layer I set with for like 10 minutes, and then I put a bunch of stuff, put more of that jelly basically on top, and it's set for two hours. Then I put more in, and it's set for another two hours. And what you have here, inverted, is this little spring confetti looking tureen. And this is really great for like if you're having a party or something. So I'll yeah, just. It looks so pretty. Yeah, it's very pretty, huh? I'm proud. <laughs> it just finished setting when I was let, ready to leave, so it may not hold up super well in the slicing part, but you get the idea. If this had set up overnight or something, it would be ideal. People are weird about eating cold stuff, but it's like, this is becoming super fashionable like in the chef world. Like I just got done sp speaking at this culinary symposium and there was like a whole class on making gels and making aspics and stuff like that because it's a super big deal right now. So I think we're going to be seeing more and more of it. If your garden doesn't have these flowers, mm -hmm. is there some place? Well, your garden likely does have these flowers because these are just the resulting flowers from a collard plant that didn't get harvested in time uh -huh. and an arugula plant that didn't get harvested in time. You can pick violets out of your yard. They're edible. Calendula. You can also leave the flowers out. Clover flowers are actually edible. Yeah, so ideally this would be like a tidy slice <laughs> and you would be, you know, eating it on a cracker or something, but right now it's just a mess of gel. You could have it with an artichoke if you want. You could eat it with an artichoke if you want. This is Jerusalem artichoke. Are you guys familiar with this? Oh, yeah. We're going to show you a lot of different ones. I don't think I've ever eaten Jerusalem artichoke. It's wonderful. It's especially this type of time of year when it's been chilled in the ground. Otherwise, it's a bit starchy. I planted some, but I'm not sure where I planted it now. When you see big tall flowers oh, yeah, bloom yeah. in August or September, then you'll know where they are. They look like sunflowers. I just planted some in my yard. Sorry, it's kind of unsightly sliced up. It was a bit ambitious trying to make a tureen before class today, but we somewhat pulled it off. And if you got it and you made it up and you didn't like it, the cool thing about gelatin and other hydrocolloids, which is what gelatin is, is that they change consistency based on their temperature or whether they're agitated. So if you didn't like it, you could just heat it up and eat soup. There you go. Actually, artichokes, you want to not eat them until sometime in November unless you're ready to deal with a lot of flatulence. One of the things we do on the farm is we try to educate people about different kinds of greens that you can eat. So I was originally going to make spring rolls tonight with a bunch of different wild greens, but instead I'm going to do chickweed pecoras, which the recipe is in your handout. I'm going to borrow one really fast. But basically, lots of cultures have their version of pecoras. If you've had tempura vegetables, you've had Japan's version of it. It's just a, an egg and milk based batter, wet batter that's fried. The cool thing about this is you can do this with anything. Um, so I have a few leftover items from the tureen that I'm probably gonna throw into these pakoras. I have some leftover watermelon radish, snow pea and leek, and some flowers, and I also have a few additional snow peas which you can just snack on or I can chop up and put in here. This is super duper simple. I'm going to show you why they're called artichokes. Years ago, Michael Gentry, one of my favorite people, chef, he teaches a class called Everybody Cooks, and he's a really inspired chef. And I was saying that one of the reasons they call them Jerusalem artichokes is they have a faint artichoke flavor. If you roast them just right, he said, yeah, Pat, you have to smoke the leaves before you can taste it. Uh -huh. um, and then I discovered the George Foreman grill for vegetables. And if you grill them, they actually taste significantly like artichokes. Indeed. One of the things I'm going to show you tonight is cress, stuffed with lamb's corners in place of spinach and Jerusalem artichokes in place of artichoke hearts. And it's pretty successful. It gives you a very similar flavor. Um, I also put a whole bunch of pea shoots in. There's a lot of recipes that we get right now for peas, and peas aren't ready yet. We're just planting them. 
But the great thing is our cover crops are filled with Austrian winter peas, and the tips of those taste just like peas. So that's another dish we're going to be showing you. But right now, we're going to do one of my favorite combinations, mosh, fennel, and beet salad, garnished with toasted uh, walnuts. And that's going to be a little bit of a thing, because I'm going to try toasting them on the grill. I think it'll work. So that I can leave Meredith to eat for, the, for her oil. So this recipe is very simple. Do you all know mosh? OK. Well, I thought that might be the case. So I'm going to give you a little taste ahead of time. One of my little bags here. Here we go. Um, I'll just come around for a little bit on your plate. Mosh is known as corn salad. And why it was called corn salad is before the New World was discovered and we had maize, which we then called corn exclusively, all the grains grown in um, Europe were called corn. And this is the weed of the cornfield. What's fun about this is if you grow it, it is the hardiest vegetable you can possibly grow. No cold bothers it. It makes it through everything. The other fun thing is that it never gets bitter. This is actually just bolting and it doesn't get bitter. It's not quite as buttery in texture. Something I love about it is the floral finish. If you taste it and let it sit for a moment in your mouth, it kind of ends floral, which is really wonderful in salads. Now, how do you spell that? M-A-C-H-E with a little umlaut over the E, I think, or maybe over the A. I, my French is not over the A. OK, good. All right, so yeah, I can do the dressing and the almonds, but the beets and the fennel we might have to imagine, unfortunately, um, which is a shame. But we'll switch it up. We'll do a quick little dressing of Meyer lemon and olive oil and some red onion and some grilled artichokes. And it'll be a different salad. That's the great news about salads is they can vary. But there's a link on your thing for the beet, um, fennel, mosh salad, and I highly recommend that one. That's very wonderful. This will be nice, but that combination is pretty perfect. If you punch into any of your search engines, beet, fennel, mosh salad, they do it with gorgonzola. I actually think the gorgonzola is, gorgonzola is overkill, so I don't bother with the gorgonzola. So we're going to do a mosh artichoke walnut salad instead. That sounds yummy. When you eat cold foods, it's harder for your palate to discern flavors. So whenever you're making cold foods, it's easy to mess that up. And it, you could easily fix that. So say you goofed like I did. When you're serving it, put a little fleur de sel on the top of it. Um, what, you know, take some take some salt, squeeze some citrus over it, I don't know, something cool, and just garnish it with the salt. And maybe a little olive oil, you could serve it with a cheese, a salty cheese. Um, so there's pl you know, plenty of ways to fix your goofs. And speaking of goofs, I will tell you how to make that salad uh, with the intended ingredients, which is you roast your beets, and then you take fennel, which we actually have in the greenhouse right now, and sliver it real fine. And then you make your dressing, which is very, very, very simple dressing. It's a combination of olive oil and walnut oil, and just a small amount, about to about a third of a cup of those oils, two tablespoons of lemon juice. And I went with Meyer lemon for a little slightly different flavor, and then salt and pepper. And then while the beets are still hot, you toss the beets and the fennel in that dressing. Um, had I been not so determined to have it be perfect, I would have tossed the whole salad there and not have forgotten that. And then what we'll do is the same kind of thing. I want to toss all of them into a warm dressing. I mean, into a, I want to toss them when they're hot into the dressing. And they'll kind of soak up the flavor and then we'll quickly toss it with the mosh. And you'll have your salad. I actually altered the recipe and I like the alteration I made a whole lot. I, have my own recipe, but I always check out the recipes online and you know other recipes when I, or I'm doing something. But I love tarragon with lemon, and I love tarragon with beets. Tarragon is used a lot in Eastern European cooking, and beets are real Eastern European. I think it's a wonderful combination. It, it worked very well in that dressing. I was also tempted to add 
miner's lettuce. Does anybody know miner's lettuce? No. Nope. Or claytonia? It's in the same family as purslane. Does anybody know purslane? Yes. Yeah. Okay, purslane is a wonderful um, weed, vegetable, that it looks like kind of like a, like a jade plant. It's prostrate on the ground, usually. So there's a golden variety that stands up taller. Very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Crispy and a slightly lemony taste. And miner's lettuce is in the same family. is not as juicy as purslane, but it's way more succulent than most greens. It's called miner's lettuce because when the 49ers got to California, they didn't think about food. All they thought was gold. So they didn't have any greens, and the only greens they got to eat was the wild Claytonia is the actual other name for it. It needs a teeny bit of protection, but just row cover is all you would need to grow it outside all winter. You're going to get the taste of fennel because I had a little bit of fennel leaves for garnish, so I'll chop them into it. You'll get it to experience the fennel flavor, too. You know, I used to not love anise or licorice, but, yeah. uh, but fennel... It's like another thing to me. I'm obsessed yeah. with oh, fennel. Yeah. I love it so much. Yeah. And once I just sort of got myself to, yeah. to yeah. eat it, yeah. like it has so many applications. It's great with, yeah. it's especially great with citrus. Um, it's just very light, you know? And I can't stop using it. I use it in darn near everything, I feel like, when it's in season. I love to make pickles with it as well. Mm with a bit of orange zest and some red pepper flake and like a white wine vinegar brine. Man, those go a long way. Okay, well, it's not the salad I intended, but it should be interesting. Can I hand these out over here? Yep. Hopefully you still have your, oh, does everyone have, just have a spoon? Or do you yeah. have a fork? Thank you. Rutabagas, mm. beets, carrots, mm -hmm. parsnips, all those roots grilled on that grill mm -hmm. caramelizes them and brings all the flavor out. I can taste artichoke yeah. in there when I grill yeah, it. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. yeah, very tasty. This is really delicious. So we're getting there with the pakoras. They're frying right now, and the burner kind of lost a little bit of its oomph because it got unplugged. But I'm at fault. No, 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 it's fine. But I can just talk about them. I kind of started talking about them earlier. It's an egg and milk-based batter. And the reason I like it better than tempura is because to make true tempura, you've got to whip the egg whites and the egg, and the egg yolks and make a foam and then fold everything together so it's like really light and fluffy. But this is just a very simple, it's almost like you're making a pancake or a waffle batter. And then you put all your veg into it and you just drop, you know, it's almost like making hot water cornbread. You just drop little clumps of it into the frying oil. And it makes a really tasty appetizer. In this batter, I added a little curry powder um, just to make it more interesting. And I've made a little dipping sauce with um, cilantro and lime and garlic and salt. Usually has ginger in it. In your recipe, it has ginger in it, but I didn't get my hands on any fresh ginger before I came. That's okay. Um, so, so yeah, one of the things I love about pakoras is that you can pretty much put anything in them. Today we're using a wild green called chickweed. If you've ever never eaten chickweed before, it's something you should consider. It's the very first thing to bloom in our region in the spring. So I think of it as like a harbinger, you know. Um, it has a very light flavor, so it's versatile. You can use it for lots of stuff. I don't really like it so much mixed into salads, so I like to use it like marinated, cooked into things, as in these fried pakoras. It's, it doesn't hold up, and I don't love the texture the way you would eat mosh, like, like Pat is describing. Some people disagree. A lot of people put it in their salads. To me, but. if you're willing to go carefully cut the tops off mm -hmm. and not get all that stringy vine, That's it's better. nice and salad. Right. But if you find the right patch, there can be nice big lush tops. Oh, totally. Shade it. That's good. But that stringy mess doesn't work for me. Right. It doesn't for me either. Let's hope it works in these pakoras because I didn't trim them very well. Um, one thing I also do in order, I'm really big on using the whole plant. So in America, people are only using like the bottom of the onion and the green top goes to waste or the green top of the leek or whatever. Um, and it's mostly just because we don't have a palate for it or we don't know how to use it. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in finding different ways for home cooks to make use of that bulk and that good food and flavor. So I do a lot of fermentation to make use of trim. So onion tops, um, fennel tops go into my sauerkraut. Onion tops go into sauerkraut. Le the stems of leafy greens like kale and collards will go in and get fermented. And that's a basic, basic ratio of five pounds of vegetable matter um, gets three tablespoons of sea salt. And then you just crush it, crush it until its juices come out and you've created a brine. Pack it in a jar, make sure the brine covers it slightly and let it sit on the counter. 
and it's going to ferment. And it's going to be very beneficial to your gut in terms of probiotics. A lot of people don't know, say, well, I don't know how to use my ferments. I've been doing, you know, what you say, and I've been using all this trim and making ferments, but I don't just want to eat a sandwich with crowd on it all the time. And so this is a great example of a way to use your fermented foods. You won't get the probiotic benefit anytime you're heating them up, but it still tastes delicious. It's got that great sourly, salty flavor. You can mix it with a Bacora batter. You can stuff it in some egg roll wrappers and make yourself some egg rolls. So there's tons of applications with this recipe, and you can just let your imagination. And Mary, you may not get the probiotic, but you will get more nutrients because totally. the fermentation has released more nutrients. That's right. A lot so of it's nutrients kind of, are bound up. Right. I can actually give you a taste of what I'm then going to cook. I brought one to taste, and we'll give you a taste of it. It's a little bit more done on the, on the green side than I want it. This recipe is one of my favorites because it was, it was totally the, the mother of hunger. Mother, the, the recipe was, was the invention of hunger. Um, I was busy working like crazy in the spring like we often are at the Highland Lake Inn and I was going back for lunch to make lunch and I just, as I walked I grabbed things. So I grabbed the sprouting flower tops of brassicas. Mary was just saying that um, That's what's you know, should have been harvested, um, you know, things that didn't get harvested as soon as they should have. I actually love to let my brassicas go a little late and get those flower tops. I think that um, this one here, the collard flower top, is one of the premier vegetables of spring. It's super good. You know? And all the flower tops are good. And this can be much taller. And the way to harvest them is like you harvest asparagus. You bend it till it snaps. And that way you're not getting the tough part, you know? Um, anyway, maybe we'll just put this on that plate too, okay? Okay, that that's great. Okay, so this is something that you will get to taste fresh cooked, but this was my trial one. And so I took those tops and I grabbed herbs as I was just moving. I grabbed what I could grab as I made it, as I made my way to the kitchen, because I didn't have time to cook. And I had leftover polenta. I threw some olive oil in the pan. Tossed the, the um, coarsely, oh, I grabbed a green onion too. I grabbed a green onion, coarsely chopped it and the tops, tossed it in the olive oil, just wilted it, took the polenta, popped it on top, and fried a patty. Salt and pepper, it was wonderful. I was so tickled, it was so elegant. This is a little different because I wanted it to hold together better. I put egg in the polenta for this one. But you don't need the egg, I mean, at home it doesn't matter. You know, trying to get it out to you, I wanted it to hold together better. But you can just fry it without the egg and it's just as good. Um, the herbs I chopped up and put in the polenta. Really fast, really simple. Lots of good nutrition. There's so many plants, there's so many things to taste and do that we can probably always have stuff, you know. The same goes for eating, you know. I mean, what we eat is so based on convention or what we're used to or what the current trends tell us to do. And so a lot of the cooking that we're doing is just try to push people's boundaries and break down myths about what's good for you, what's not good for you. So the perfect example is those Jerusalem and Martin chucks. Right. Lots of farmers have them on their farms. They don't bring them to the market because nobody knows them. Wants, nobody wants to buy them. They're, getting, they're becoming very, um, very posh right now, though. Oh, are they? Yeah, they're on a lot of menus as sun chokes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, that is the same thing? Same thing, yeah. yeah that's oh. what I was wondering what the name yeah. was. Yeah. The story, which may or may not be true, as to why they're called Jerusalem artichokes is that in Italian, gerasole means follow the sun. Uh -huh. So they were called gerasole by the Italians because they're a sunflower which kind of follows the sun. I've read other places that that's not at all true and they have no idea why they're called Jerusalem artichokes. You know? <laughs> and until I discovered that you, did people agree that there was a kind of artichoke flavor in those grilled artichokes? Yeah. I think most people think that that's just also, there's nothing to that. I don't know if y'all got to taste the, the polenta green dish yet. Um, okay, so I think it'll be even better the one I'm going to make right here for now because that was I was making it kind of rushing, cooking other things, and I just did it as a trial to make sure it worked. It was a little overdone, you know, and hopefully I won't have that happen. So how that's going to work is I have a batter of polenta. I cooked the polenta up this morning and did one trial, and that was the way I did it that day without the egg, and I found that. It didn't matter to me at all that day because I just took it and flopped it on my plate. I didn't care. It didn't have to go anywhere. But I tried, you know, actually getting that patty to carry and go somewhere, and it didn't want to do it, you know. It was fine. Nicely grilled, good flavor, just to flip on a plate and eat right at home. Mm -hmm. But to hand, pass out to you, it wasn't going to work. 
So that's where I came back in this afternoon. And of course, the polenta had all hardened, which is what it does. You know, mm -hmm. Lots of times, you let it harden in a loaf pan and cut it up and fry it. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to put the greens in it. So what I did was take that polenta, mix an egg into it, and beat the egg into it. And that egg then made it so that it was, it was a batter, and I could fit the greens in it too. And indeed, um, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do is like put onion in, get the onion slightly translucent, then add the greens, a little salt and pepper, and saute it until it's just wilted. The greens are just wilted. Then I'll take them and I'll mix them into the batter. What I tried in that one, I didn't like it so much because they all stayed on one side and kind of burned when I tried to cook it, um, was I just pressed them into one side. But then when I flipped it, in order for it to brown that much, the greens were overcooked a little, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're going to try it the other way right now. When you buy polenta, I'm not, I've never used it. Mm -hmm. What form is it when you take it home? Golden grits downstairs. Oh, Organic is it golden powder? grits. No, no, it's, oh. it's, gold, it's yellow grits. Okay. I, I used to cook at Penland School of Crafts, uh -huh. and there are a lot of Yankees that come down. I'm a Yankee, by the way. Um, you know, and they all don't like grits, and they didn't want to be served grits. And you get a what temp do you want? Um, I want probably typical sautéing temp, whatever that is. My grandmother used to make it and cut it up and then fry it. It was delicious. Well, at Pentland, they all like saw that I said this really wonderful, very simple polenta dish with a fresh tomato basil sauce on it, and. The word got out I was serving grits. And I had to swear up and down, backwards and forwards. It was not grits, it was polenta. I was cooking golden grits in the back. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's, the same. it's the exact same thing. But I, they weren't going to eat it if it was grits. They would eat polenta, but they wouldn't eat grits. Oh, it is you know? the same. It's the exact same thing. So is it non-GMO? Um, not if you're getting golden grits, but the stuff downstairs is organic, so it's very much non-GMO. You know? Back then, when I was cooking at Penland, GMOs were not prevalent. You know. So it wasn't GMO then either. I did not use any commercial corn. Okay. Bob's bread mill won't sell GMOs. So if you ever buy Bob's bread mill, he has lots of his corn stuff, and it's maybe, it may or may not be organic, but it won't be GMO. But the best deal here is just their Golden Grits bulk. I think it's from Lindley Mills. Yeah. They're just like they're great grits, very good price. I was just going to talk briefly about the other recipes that I contributed to the handout. Um, there's a beet carpaccio, which is kind of a riff on a beef carpaccio, which is traditionally made with beef tenderloin. But this is just roasted beets. You roast them with the skins on in foil at like 400 degrees. And then the sort of steam that builds up in the foil, once they've cooled, will allow you to peel them very easily. And then I paired it with a onion bacon marmalade. Um, so it's just like a basically slow caramelized onions with balsamic and sugar and some bacon bits. Um, and a little bit of garlic. And serving those for like an appetizer would be a really great spring or fall. A lot of these vegetables, you, they're, they're kind of carryovers. Like we were talking about making a pumpkin ragu or something tonight to just demonstrate that if you have winter squash that's left over from last season, there's a lot of great spring. Time to make it so I bought it. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> a lot of great spring recipes that you can use those fall vegetables for. And again, they really are just cool season crops. So even if you associate them with fall, they're very often available in the spring. And so, yeah, the beet carpaccio, recommend a little like Parmesan grated over top of it, super delicious. Um, and the other one I did was a skewer. I thought it'd be fun to have a skewer appetizer, and it is apple, Jerusalem, artichoke, shiitake, mushroom, and onion with a bourbon glaze. Um, re really straightforward, just mixing up bourbon, sugar, tamari, and garlic in a bowl putting your veg in there, tossing it all around, and throwing it on, the, on a hot grill. Very easy, very tasty. Something I could do, which would be more lush, and you may like it, but you may not want to do it because it's not as you know, healthy, probably, is I could mix Parmesan cheese into this. You know, that would make it even richer. I don't think it needs it. You got to taste it. What do you think? Do you think it needs it? And I think we can leave it out. Save the cheese for something else, you know? Um, so I have, this is the polenta with the egg mixed into it and fresh herbs and salt and pepper. We're gonna cook the onions just for a moment until they turn a little translucent. Then we're just gonna wilt the greens. Then it's all gonna come back out, get mixed in with the um, polenta mix and get cooked, get browned and that'll be your dish. You know, this old Italian lady one time told me the best way to cook polenta because a lot of people don't wanna cook it because you have to stir it and stir it and stir it. 
And the best way to do it, and it works like a charm, is you get your water boiling or your stock or whatever you're cooking it in, and then you pour in the polenta as you're whisking. And then you take a paper bag, like the flat side of a paper bag, put it over the pot, and you put the lid over it. You turn it on low, and you just walk away. 20, 30 minutes later, you come back, and it's perfect, silky, solidified polenta. You didn't have to stir it the whole time. And what do you know? I tried it. It worked great. I put a diffuser on. It's, I make sure it's a thick pan. Mm -hmm. And I use three and a quarter cups of water to every cup of polenta. Now, well, I do four cups. It's yeah, four that, cups of that takes too long. I can't, you know, I can't wait that yeah. long. You know? you and you have to stir it more to get it. You know, the, it's yeah, I just take like the side off of a paper bag, and I put it on top of the pot, and then I put the lid on top of that. So if you don't have a heat diffuser, maybe try it. It just gets wet and gross and you throw it away afterwards. But you want to have overhang, right? So that it doesn't just get wet and collapse into the pot. But the lid will hold it on and then it'll have some weight on the outside. Do you season the polenta? Uh, I usually don't until after it's finished. And then I stir in whatever cheese or seasonings I want to use. Me too. I usually just salt. I mean, I salt and pepper maybe. That's about all I put in the water. I hardly ever cook with water. I usually always use stock or alcohol or vinegar or whatever, you know. And so, so I would probably cook it in a veggie stock, or even chicken, chicken stock, duck stock, lamb stock, whatever. He's saying a cup of the grits to three and a quarter cups of water. Yeah, Michael Jensen said he did four. It's really creamy. It's just like it takes way too long. I went up a quarter, and it's qualitative. Just different. Right on. You're in a hurry. Try three and a quarter. Okay, I will. See what it does. I'm always in a hurry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> So about 280 is the right temperature. What does it say on the instructions? Four? Three. three. But maybe a little more, right? It gets a yeah, it does get really thick. You don't want it to get all dry and crusty. So what was the green stuff that you put in that product? Chickweed. So you can see it here. It's like you've seen it in your garden 5,000 times. It's like the little... Here, let's see. you a can of chickweed killer. Oh, they have a specific but you, poison just to kill chicken. It's animals. easy to pull up. It's an easy weed to pull up, but you can also eat it. And again, like the stems like this, you would want to not use those for fresh eating, but did they do okay inside the fried pakora? Was it okay? So good. Good. Very good. good. Go look in your grass. It's probably coming up in your grass. If you notice the very first thing that's blooming in the spring, it has a little white or a little yellow flower. And it's present all winter. It's very hardy. It likes rich soil, though. You won't see it growing on the roadside very often. It likes it rich. Why is this so good for you, Pat? Minerals, I think, and deep bioaccumulator. Because it likes fertile soil. It's taking up all those nutrients. Would Susan you, Weed goes on, goes on pages on. about it. Yeah. yeah, I bet. Would you grow it in your garden? I mean, by seed? Well, it'll grow. You don't have to introduce it. It'll be there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's a great book, Weeds and What They Tell. The basic premise being a weed is any plant that's growing where you don't want it, but it's right. useful regardless, like in terms of planetary life or even to your health. So if you find the right application and you know what it is, it can also tell you things about your soil. If you have an extremely wet area that's getting waterlogged, then you might have more pigweed or you might have more polygonum. Um, and then, you know, chickweed only likes fertile soil. So you know you're doing something right if you have chickweed, right? Um, turns out you need it too. Okay, so the stuff has all been cooked, and now we're just going to make little patties and brown them, and that'll be it. Can I mix anything up um, for the good folks? We um, actually want to, I have, I have a, a filling made, which okay. is lamb's quarters and artichoke hearts, but I thought we might also do a spinach and um, maybe use up some of your snow peas. We're good for time. And while I'm cooking, I'll tell you about one of the recipes that I put uh, as, a, as a, you did get the beet, re the borscht recipe on there, did you? Yeah, the borscht yeah. recipe. Okay. All right, so I put a borscht recipe on there, and I'll tell you the truth, I've never used that recipe. <laughs> it's just, it looked like a, a simple one. I, I looked at it, I know borscht, I'm Ukrainian, half Ukrainian. Every Christmas Eve, petaha, we call them, not pierogies, which is, you know, like pierogies, dumplings stuffed with potatoes and cheese and potatoes and sauerkraut. Borscht, you know, those are, and you know, other kinds of very specific vegetarian kind of dishes. That's what I do. So I make, I make borscht every Christmas Eve. And the recipe I love the most is from the Moosewood Cookbook. Okay. The thing is, it is way more involved. So this one looked a little simpler. And so that's why I chose it. The snow peas just sliced? Yeah, and I think we have some pea shoots we can add in too. Okay, how much spinach? Like this? A cup? Yeah. That's probably good, yeah. yeah. 
Hey, Pat, what is the name of the training word for the equivalent of like pierogies or something? Pierogies, pet hat. Yeah. Pet -a -hat. You call them pet hat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what my grandma called it. Yeah, pet hat. Yeah. Are you Ukrainian as yeah. well? Yeah. Oh, wow. The American thing is pierogi. So, you know. That's the Polish thing. That's Polish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like the pakora. Every culture has its equivalent, right? The empanada, the pierogi, the peta, whatever you call it. Just pick your name. It's the same thing. It's dough stuffed with goodness. And also pizza, they had mushroom pierogi mm -hmm. like about a month or two ago, and they were in beet kvass. Beet kvass. Like fermented beet. Right. Mm -hmm. They do a great job with ferments at that. All Souls Pizza. It's one of the restaurants in Asheville that I can honestly say I have a solid meal all the way through when I go there. It's very good. And they do a lot with fermentation, which yeah, I appreciate. Yeah. So I've got this chopped. You want snow peas. What kind of slip are you going to put in there? You're just putting these in the crepes? That's it? I'm going to put this in the crepes, some sautéed artichoke, which will be a little different from grilled. And I think we have the first crepe we're going to do this filling here, which is lamb's quarters, which lamb's quarters are in the same family as spinach. The Latin name for the spinach family is chenopodium, and in Latin that means goosefoot. And if oh. you look at lamb quarter leaves, they look like a goosefoot. Okay. So that, they're the source of the name, I think. Yeah, it's the same family as beet and chard as well. So interesting how we've um, ignored certain plants in the same family and come to love others. Well, and lamb's quarters are just like chickweed. They grow where the soil is rich. The other interesting thing is they look exactly like the quinoa plant. In fact, I had an intern one time who said, and she was at Warren Wilson, and she said, I planted my whole patch of quinoa, and I had to pull it all up because it was all lamb's quarters. <laughs> and I had to say, nope, that was all quinoa. That was all your quinoa. <laughs> If you think goosefoot, you see a plant out there that can get quite tall and has a goosefoot looking leaf, that's lamb's quarters. In my mind, I actually like it more than spinach. You'll get to try both tonight for cooked. I like spinach way more raw. Some people like to eat lamb's quarter raw. To me, it's way too dry. But that dryness actually is great when you're um, cooking it because it's just, it makes it meatier. You know? it's, and it's a little wilder tasting, I think, too, don't you? Yeah, definitely. So we've done a few wild greens, or lesser known greens, I should say. Lamb's quarters, pea shoots. Mosh. Mosh. Chickweed. Yep. Yeah. Talked about miner's lettuce. And indeed, I'm afraid that a bag didn't come too. I wanted to do some sheep sorrel. I had some sheep sorrel. I was going to chop that up. And do y'all know sheep sorrel? Do you know French sorrel? OK. It's in the same family um, as buckwheat, actually. And it's rhubarb, buckwheat. buckwheat and rhubarb, huh. okay? And they all have a tartness, right? I mean, mm -hmm. rhubarb is so tart in the stent and leaves that they, they can hurt you. It's, you know, there's so much oxalic acid, it can poison you. But they all have some oxalic acid, and French sorrel makes leaves look like chard, and they make like fish sauce out of it and sorrel soup. Do you know what they use this for? You don't put it in salad? Oh, yeah, a little bit in salad, but I like to use the sheep sorrel for that. The sheep sorrel is really lovely. It's wild, and it's got an arrowhead kind of look with a very distinctive two little wings that come off the bottom. That's my favorite kind. Yeah, sheep sorrel I think is my favorite too. Plus, you don't have to grow it; it's everywhere. You know. Um, <laughs> but the nice thing about French sorrel is you can get a lot in a hurry. You know, mm -hmm. if you're in a hurry to cook something. If I'm making soup, I prefer to use French sorrel. That reminds me, one of the recipes. Did you put the recipe in there for the watercress cream of watercress? Yes, soup? I did. I wanted that in there for two reasons. Because something I wanted to make for you today and I didn't get to make because it's not ready yet is cream of nettle soup. Do you all know stinging nettles? Yes. Stinging nettles is one of my favorite spring greens. It's incredibly rich in minerals. And when you make anything out of it, it is the brightest green you ever saw. It is just incredibly green. Very good for you. Actually quite high in protein. And once you have cooked it, there is no stink. But to me, I like to do soups because if you undercook it, although it doesn't sting, there's a grittiness that I don't like at all. And that's the same little hairs, you know? So I love to do soups with it. And so that cream soup recipe you have there, you can substitute stinging nettles. It'll be spectacular. You know? Or you can get fancy and do half stinging nettles, half press. You know? um, 
which would be very nice too. I've done both of those. I think this is going to be ready. The watercress recipe that's in your handout has, gives a very good technique for texturing your soup, which is to cook everything, strain off the liquids, but reserve the liquids, and puree only the solids, and then add the stock back a cup at a time until you get the consistency that you want. Because it's, it's super easy, right, when we're adding our stock to add a little bit too much or a little bit too a small of an amount so that it's not the right consistency when we get back to it and or get it pureed. For some soups, like borscht, I like to only puree some. I like it creamy, but I also want the textures of the borscht vegetables. With the um, stinging nettle, I like to puree the whole thing. You know, I'm not a big fan of stinging nettle texture. I love the flavor. I love it in soups. I love it in teas. Texture, eh, I can do without it, you know? So I like to puree that one. Okay, this is ready to serve. Can if I you all can just... Can Pardon? Can I unplug the grill? Um, yes, it'll just heat up if I leave it on. Unplug right? it. Yeah, just unplug it. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so if you'll come up, I'll just give you all. And if this pan was faster, I might have browned these a little more, but I think it's cooked enough. Is it cooked enough? Mm -hmm. it's, been solid. it's already cooked anyway, right? Yeah, well, the polenta, I want the egg cooked, that's for sure. Well, where do you buy these things? The little things? I got them at the Goodwill. I can't tell you where you get them. <laughs> I got a lot of things at the Goodwill. Yeah, <laughs> um, But I think if you go to like, a, like maybe um, Kitchen and Company, they might have them there. Oh, okay. Dollar store. Yeah. So now you're going to have sautéed artichokes, and they're different. They won't be as artichokey, but they're still very nice. You know, the thing about artichokes is you can roast them, and they're different. You can eat them raw. They're wonderful with a dip like um, if y'all ever make a dip out of like tahini and um, tamari and vinegar and a teeny bit of sweetener, some garlic and some lemon. A wonderful dip, mm -hmm. wonderful, and a lot bunch of chopped parsley, bunch of cho chopped parsley and everything. Um, it makes a really nice um, dip. I've ever brought that kind of dip, or even fancier almond butter that way. Oh. Or, and you can also go, go towards using ginger in that mix. Mm -hmm. um, and I've ever brought the artichokes raw with that dip oh. to, a, to a party, oh. and boy, gone in no time. You know. And they're probably wondering, what are we eating? Yum. It's a good conversation starter. You know, a lot of people come up here and talk to you about it. You know, does anybody have an aversion to dairy? Okay. Okay. Then you probably don't want to eat the crabs because there is milk in those. Okay. You can have the filling. You know, um, and maybe I can fry up a little of this with it. You know, this is made with an, a milk that's very special. It's it's got the A2 gene in it. There's, apparently, there was a genetic mutation made milk less good for us and most European cows have that A1 gene it's a protein that doesn't work um, so you might do better with this milk you know? yeah no it's it's pretty new I'm pretty amazed we're able to get it actually and we'll start making the crepes why I asked about the dairy is I think I will put a little bit of Parmesan in everybody else's stuffing but yours okay um, I think it be just as good without it, but it'll be a little, a little bit more exciting probably. And then I'm going to actually top it with a little bit of this. Um, this here is something I want to talk about, but I'll get this off the heat before I do. Um, I want to make my own sauce. I haven't yet yet do it. I just found this product. It's a new product to me in the co-op. It's a pasta sauce made with squash. Oh. Um, oh. Tuscan pasta sauce, and it's got squash and tomatoes, and. Um, Herbs and a little bit of cream, so you might not want that part either, you know. Um, and it certainly is not a two, you know. <laughs> but I had it. I tried it for the first time this weekend. It was very nice. A nice change of pace with pasta, you know. And I think it'd be very easy to make. You know, you just cook a squash um, and puree it with um, some tomato sauce. Um, add the herbs. I was actually, if I was making my making it. From scratch, I would have used sage probably. I would have gotten the sage route. You know, sage and a little bit of thyme, maybe a little teeny bit of nutmeg. Um, I think the herbs that they use are a little bit more Mediterranean, but um, quite nice. And we're going to probably put that on on the crepes. But I'll probably put it on half the crepe, so you can try it with the sauce and without the sauce. And you can tell me which you like more. Can I borrow that little spatula? Really yes, fast? you can. Certainly. And I think I might just try the crepe in here because it's already heated up. 
And I don't want to wait for the other thing to heat up, so I think I can make it work in here. So have y'all ever made crepes? Uh, maybe years ago. <laughs> so the trick is you want to pour in the pan and then kind of let it spread in the pan so it's pretty thin. And this is an official crepe recipe. I make crepes all the time and I don't use any recipe at all. You know? I just you know, wing it. I, got, I use eggs and milk. You know? okay. um, sometimes I use pancake batter. I just make it real thin. Hmm. You know? um, it's a quick breakfast for me. You know, if I don't have bread and I want, want that kind of meal, I'll make a quick crep and fill it with some veggies and maybe, you know, usually uh, an over easy egg because I want I want to be able to get the benefit of the fats so I don't want to cook the yolk. And I'll just kind of cook the greens a little bit, have the egg cooking on top of the greens. And so it just is barely cooked when I flip it. And I flip it so that it's covered with greens on both sides. It cooks nicely. I then toss it into the crep and purposely want it to break, you know. It spreads through the crepe, I roll it up, and it's a fast, easy breakfast. Do you use a crepe pan? No, nah, I don't ever. Oh, yeah. so I just use these, necessary. you know. So I have a griddle at home, too. I use that, you know. Okay. So the batter for the crepe, for the crepe um, does it have to be very thin? I mean, pretty thin. How, how do you like thin it? Thin enough so it's smoothly, you know. <coughs> you can just look at this batter and um, get an idea, you know. This is a buckwheat batter. The recipe that Deborah Madison has that we gave you calls for much more white flour than I used. I use just a teeny bit of white flour. I love, I personally at home, I do 100% buckwheat crepes. I will confess that my niece had them one time and said it's kind of like eating burlap. <laughs> but she's like, she likes being a wise, a wise, uh -huh. wise guy too. You know? Well, also buckwheat, it has an amazing capacity to absorb liquid. So I'm wondering if she did that just to make it a little bit more foolproof because mm -hmm. right as you're working with it the buckwheat's absorbing liquid and the batter's going to get ruined and as you're cooking it you're not going to get a good crepe out of it so if you do use buckwheat you want to maybe add liquid to thin the batter as you go you all kind of feel you can do the things that we've showed you tonight yeah some of them anyway we can find the, bread. Find the ingredients yes um, <laughs> in your back well just know that if you find like a wild green like that just substitute you know? spinach okay. spinach for lamb's quarters that's why I showed you both the I'm gonna do both the okay. spinach and the lamb's quarter one either one works you know and if you go to the markets now mm -hmm. I'm largely responsible for creating this market mm -hmm. I've been selling lamb's quarter at the market for about 15 years when I first sold it oh, really? other people said you're selling weeds and I said try them you know <laughs> I know who's a uh, Batchmore farm sells sorrel okay every spring if you're interested in Sheep sorrel, you can get it from him. He and sells at West Asheville and North Asheville. If I had remember, if I hadn't left the sorrel with my beet salad, mm -hmm. it would have been chopped up and put in the second crap. It would have mm -hmm. had a lemon flavor. You know? yeah. um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the filling for this one. Um, this is lamb's quarters, grilled Jerusalem artichokes, grilled nice and soft, right? and pea shoots. And pea shoots, any pea plant, you can eat the tip, okay? One of the common ones that we use for cover crops is called Austrian winter pea, and it works wonderfully as a, as a pea shoot. Basically, you want to harvest the tip down to the first large leaf that surrounds the stem like this, okay? Every bit of that will be tender, and it'll taste just like peas. Oftentimes, be quite sweet. Rarely do I cook them, but tonight I did. And if you're going to cook pea shoots, a split second, not quite, but about no more than 20 seconds, or they'll just disappear. They're so delicate, they'll be gone. Okay. So I threw these in the pan with a fair amount of oil, quickly wilted them, tossed them in the blender with the lamb's quarters, which I had sauteed, and the Jerusalem artichokes, a drop of balsamic vinegar, mostly for liquid, and to add a little bit of zinc, okay. and then salt and pepper, and that's everything that's in that, that filling. Now. I'm going to put a little bit of Parmesan cheese on all of this but one end. Okay. So this is kind of like the same concept as all those artichoke spinach dips. You know, that's the, oh. that's the concept that I'm approaching here. And a lot of recipes, if they're using it this way, would do something like sour cream or something like that. And I just thought that was a little overkill. 
I want you to really taste the greens. You can tell me if you think it'd be better with sour cream. Most things are, of course. You know. <laughs> There's the, the filling. Parmesan cheese. Oh, and then we're going to toss this in the pan for a moment to warm it up. Won't take very much. I don't think there's very much cream in it. It doesn't taste super creamy. It's time for the crust. Yeah, those Cinderella pumpkins are real good to cook with. Right, there are so many wonderful squash. We actually did a squash tasting. We had a harvest event uh, the November before last, and we just had so many squash to taste. I was just pretty much sick of squash by the end of the night. <laughs> but they were pretty wonderful. I mean, it took, it took a lot to get sick of it. No. We'll be doing that harvest event again this year on November 15th. If you guys are interested, we'll have a meal at the farm. We'll be doing some storytelling. Should be a good time. Should be a great time, yeah. And there's all kinds of possibilities of the things we may do. Oh my goodness. I may actually get a, a barley crop. I might actually get to make beer out of it. Great. I'll probably barley. start fermenting some stuff now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it really is, that one's about a celebration. So we just try to do the most special stuff we can. Because mm -hmm. we want to celebrate the whole year. It's like, mm -hmm. we teach stuff, it's just what we did. But it's really not so much about, most of our classes are about like, you know, we want to get lots of information so you can like be sustainable and all. This is like, we want to get up a good time. Mm -hmm. you know? We want you to I'm celebrate. Need a drink. You know? Yeah. Okay, so if you come on up, the first crep is here, and then we'll go to the next one. You want me to cut it in four? Oh, you already did. Oh, oh yeah. Mm. And let me know what you think of the buckwheat. I actually think buckwheat is way more interesting than regular white crepes. Um, just so much more flavor. This is buckwheat flour. Buckwheat flour. There's about three tablespoons of white flour in there. Like, you know, what do you think? Tasty. Okay, so now we'll do the next crepe. They are absolutely. It's the idea. Yeah, you totally. Save them for my yeah. Pillow. Yep. yep. Yeah, they're a celebration food. Asparagus crepes are one of my favorite things to do in the asparagus season. Mm -hmm. And that actually, I use sorrel on that too. You know, sorrel goes really nicely with asparagus. That was so good. I love putting um, different seasonings in the crepes too, like a Thai seasoning in the crepe, maybe some flax seeds marinating vegetables to roll up inside. So there's endless variations, right, on the batter itself to give it more flavor and a different sort of intrigue. And they really should be de demystified. They are just not that hard to make at all. Yeah. It's pretty darn easy. The other, the close relative of the crepe is the dosa, mm -hmm. which I love to make, which is actually like rice and lentil that's ground in some water and then fermented. Um, and then you mix other things into it and you fry it, similar to a crepe, and it's so delicious. Um, and we can get you a recipe for those if you want. You can email me. Is it a crepe recipe it Yes, is it, is. Yeah, it is. It is. Just know that I did not use as much white flour. So if you like mine, basically much more buckwheat, just about four tablespoons of white flour. Okay. Right. The truth is, if I was doing it at home, I wouldn't use any white flour. I just use buckwheat. Yeah. <laughs> And my niece would say it tasted like burlap. Mm -hmm. She likes being able to do that anyways. You know? yeah. She thinks she's pretty smart. You know? <laughs> she is pretty smart. So you can mix up that batter and keep it in the refrigerator? Yeah, I mean, eventually there's eggs that'll spoil, but it'll yeah. last a couple days. Easy. But the filling is yeah. Oh, the filling, no. So the filling, you're going to have to write down. I'll tell, I'll tell you it, okay? Um, but Mary was like, give me the recipe. I said, I don't have it yet. I'm making it up, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm happy to tell you it now, okay? So the first filling was 
about the same size bunch of lamb's quarters that you saw Meredith do spinach, okay? Um, and about, about a half cup. a small red onion. How much? About a cup. Okay. About a half a small red onion. Um, and about this much pea shoots, okay? okay. Um, and they were just, you know, you can probably buy them at, at markets. There probably will be some people selling them. But if you have any friends that have cover crops, then you can go pick your own, you know? Um, and all those were coarsely chopped. While I was chopping that, I had artichokes grilling, okay? Because I wanted them nice and soft so they would um, cook up real quick. I mean, grind, blend up real quick. And then I just took the onion, put it in the pan. When it was almost translucent, I added the lamb's quarters. When they got dark green, I tossed the, and I used, I probably used a little more oil than I sometimes, usually I just kind of barely cloak the bottom. But I wanted, the purpose of the oil is to get it to blend well, you know? I use very high quality olive oil. Usually I don't cook with this olive oil. This was, I bought it from um, some people that were selling at Mother Earth News two years ago. They guaranteed it not to go rancid, it hasn't. But we paid $75 for less than a half gallon. Wow. And it's excellent. It's, it, and so for this class, I was going over the top, you know? <laughs> um, Wow. That's a but any good olive oil will work, you know. But never buy olive oil that's not extra virgin, you know. And you want it cold pressed. Um, okay, so um, salt and pepper, put it in the blender. It didn't want to blend up as quick as I wanted it to, so probably a half teaspoon of, of balsamic vinegar. Could you taste that little tang? Yeah. Um, that was it. Nothing else, you know. And then, as I, when I put it on the crepe, I, for everybody but you, I dribbled some Parmesan cheese on top of it and then put a little bit of warmed up sauce. And that was it. You know, that was the dish. Um, pretty fast, pretty easy. You know? Yeah. And obviously, if you cook like me, the amounts will vary every time. You know? um, it has to do with how much you have. You know? And... What, you're, what mood you're in at the moment. So, my question now is, would you like more of the pasta sauce on this crepe? Okay? I vote for it. Okay, yes? Yeah, okay. I think it'll be good. I think it'll be very nice. But we could do it without, and it'd be nice that way too. And I think I'm gonna turn it off, because we're out of time anyways. For this amount of buckwheat flour and all-purpose flour, you would you you would use three eggs. You know, I actually made a half a recipe. Okay. So that jar you see is half a recipe. That'll make a lot of crepes. Yeah. So I, you know, I just looked at it and thought I just don't need that much, you know. Um, and I just didn't make as much as it called for. And I got a bunch left over. I'll get to eat crepes tomorrow morning. And you said you don't really have to add the all-purpose flour, right? I didn't. I wouldn't. No. I use pure buckwheat and I love it. You know? I highly recommend pure buckwheat. You know, I don't think you need the all-purpose flour at all. I think that Deborah is aiming her cookbook at a broad audience. Mm -hmm. And some people just aren't ready for that strong a flavor. Whereas I love the strong flavor of buckwheat crepes. Mm -hmm. it, it stands up to everything and it, to me it enhances it, you know? So it's... I. I love my sister dearly, and she no longer does pancakes for Christmas, and I'm so happy because she would serve these white pancakes, <laughs> and I just, I don't have a heart for them, you know, I mean, you know, and, and she makes a great white pancake, and I, you know, I could tell it was a wonderful white pancake, but just way too bland for me. I just don't really want white pancakes, you know. Um, but she was cooking for kids, you know. <laughs> right. I know what my niece thinks of my crepes, so. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to skip the Parmesan for this. I don't think it needs it. And I'll do a slice for you on this one, too. OK, thanks. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Any feedback? How, what, what could have been better for you in this class? That was wonderful. <laughs> I didn't expect to get fed so much. No, I didn't either. Yeah, that's right. that was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we usually say, oh, we'll do one tasting and one demo. And then we end up with like two tastings and one demo. Or I whatever. ended up doing three things. Yeah. Thank you. I could throw another one.